Welcome, everyone. I am so happy to be speaking with your MasterCard Player of the Week. We have Blabber. I feel like I'm always talking to you about some kind of award you're getting or whatnot, but first things first, after starting off the split with a bunch of Olaf duty, what did it feel like this week to kick it back with some Lee Sin? Um, well, pretty good. Lee Sin's always been one of my uh, favorite champs to play, and um, I feel like it's really nice because you're able to make so many different plays as Lee, whereas on Olaf, you're kind of one-dimensional. Uh, you just farm every camp, and then you chew the dragon when it spots. <laughs> That's totally fair. Now, one thing with your performance on Lee Sin and the many things that you've brought to the table, many commend Cloud9 for the way that they foster young uh, North American talent, including yourself. And now we see 100 Thieves coming to the table trying to do the same. So what is your take on the way that these organizations in the LCS try to foster talent that come natively? Um... Like other teams besides G9, you mean? Or yeah, just teams within the LCS in general, whether it be Cloud9 or other organizations, as you've noticed. Um, I think generally teams aren't the best, I'd say, in NA about fostering new NA talent. I think C9 is like one of the exceptions. I think they are really good at picking up new talent um, and, you know, putting in the time and effort to make them better, I guess. Um, I do think there are NA players that could definitely be good enough to play LCS, but I think there might there are like a lot of veterans that that stick around and not enough new NA players that come, I guess. Because um, I do think if you really want to compete internationally, you need uh, you can only have two imports, right? So you need three good uh, NA residents. <laughs> Well, speaking to your own experience then, because if anybody knows what it's like to be a player being fostered and coming up through the scene, it's you. So what were the things that you focus on as a player or think any player aspiring to be a professional should when looking for those native opportunities? Um, I mean, I don't think my case is really uh, normal. I, I definitely say I'm really unique in what happened in that uh, I got to play my first academy split with sneaky Jensen and Smoothie. Um, I would not many people will have that experience in Academy. And four weeks in, I play LCS. Uh, I go to Worlds, my first split ever. And I think it's super unique for my case. But I definitely think and if you want to really improve as a rookie, you need to be surrounded by veterans who can really teach you the game. So I mean, I do think like veterans in the scene is, is obviously a good thing. Um, but if you really want to foster yourself as a young talent you need people like good staff as well as other good players around you to help you learn now i give you mad props for giving props to all of those around you really the players and the staff but i mean let's face it you as an individual have also accomplished a lot people are speaking about the caliber of play you brought to the table so i've got to challenge you to put it on yourself for a second right now <laughs> Do you feel that you have the potential to be one of the strongest players that the LCS has seen? Um, yeah, I mean, I think even right now, I think I'm one of the best players in the league. Um, I could say the same for every single one of my teammates. I think we're all one of the best. And um, I think it's just something that we will continue to do. Uh, we want to keep dominating and we want to keep being the best. And obviously our end goal is going to Worlds and doing well up through the split. So. Uh, hopefully we accomplish it. Such a classic Cloud9 way. I try to get you to talk about yourself and you still manage to talk about how wonderful your team is. But I got to respect it, man. I know you got a match to go ahead and get ready for. So I'm going to let you do that. And I'm going to get back to the desk myself. So I'll catch you later. Yep. Thank you. Like I said, I got to respect it. I can't get Blabber to talk about himself. And granted, we have been talking about Blabber plenty from week to week. So let's take a page out of his book. It's time to talk about some of the other Cloud9 members on that roster. First things first, giving a shout out to Vulcan, who has been a very dominating force as support in the bot lane. Yeah, definitely want to give a shout out to him. He's someone who people always talk about being uh, underrated. I don't think it's about being underrated so much as uh, maybe under talked about, under discussed. 
He's uh, became the best support in North America pretty quietly because there's you know this giant black hole of attention in the mid and jungle uh, for for Cloud9. But he has been absolutely incredible ever since joining from from a uh, clutch. And he and Sven, you know, I was watching. They had only been solo killed once, and I think it was this split. I'll have Stastin correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I don't think Vulcan has ever died in a two v two just like trading pattern. And the one time Sven did die was like he was too far forward on Aphelios while Vulcan was on warding duty or something. So he has been absolutely incredible. Incredible. And he is number two on the global KDA leaderboard. He was number one last week. Uh, Sven, not too far behind, though. Yeah, Sven is obviously a big part of this, right? When we talk about the play style of Cloud9 being so focused around the jungle and the mid lane, the bot lane still has its own presence here. So, Wild Turtle, you have experience playing against this bot lane duo, and Sven specifically, what does he offer? Uh, he's just very consistently good in laning and making good de team decisions. I would say their bot lane is like obviously one of the best in the leagues. But I think what makes them really good is just how well they're playing with their teammates as well. And in trying to support the rest of the teammates, it feels like you look at someone like Vulcan, right? That needs to be a playmaker. Everyone works towards that aggression that Blabber is allowed to offer. Probably as a duo here in the bottom, though, they are really difficult to go against Cloud9 in general. What is CLG looking to do, whether it's something to exploit or just put themselves at the forefront for a victory, not just in winning victory, but maybe even a little gold for themselves or something? Well, I mean, you want an obtainable goal, and it's obviously not kill Sven or Vulcan, because it seems like their their KDAs are just too good. It's not worth going after them. But as we can see, the gold early game, that is the one weakness you can kind of exploit on C9. And by that, I mean, is you can actually get a gold lead against C9 early. There's three games at 10 minutes where they're actually behind in gold. And this is the time where you can actually out skirmish them a bit if you can play well enough. And after that, what you have to do is you need to be, have a stable gold lead. You don't want it to skyrocket back up. I don't expect it to skyrocket it down, but I just want to <laughs> have a more stable gold lead if they can achieve it. If you lose that early game skirmish, though, it's going to look like, you know, the first three graphs of Immortals EG where it just goes all the way in C9's favor. But if they can keep a, you know, a dead heartbeat monitor, that's what they want in their gold lead today. For once, we are not asking for big swings one way or another. We are asking for some consistency and tranquility. But with that, we're going to relax a bit. Everyone in the audience should because we are heading into game soon enough. Freak and Kobe, take it away. Thank you very much, Gabby. Yes, this is going to be an exciting one, a battle at the top of the table. Cloud9, the undisputed best team in the LCS. They've lost two individual games all year long. And CLG have found themselves in second place and have been a, a, a sweetheart because, I mean, they were, they were miserable in spring and summer has been so much better. Yeah, and remember, they also started the season by getting perfect gamed. And yep. they've, they've made it up to second place here. So it definitely has been, uh, you know, a big rise for them. Cloud9, though, like you're saying, top dog in the LCS for the entirety of spring as well as summer. We are into the way with five bands done already. More Twisted Fate going to get dropped off the table. Volibear going to start riding the bench a whole lot more here in the LCS. Interesting to see CLG still banning Yumi, a champ that I really do not think is that viable anymore. I think the nerfs are big enough to not make her that big of a concern. I would say let your opponents play her if you want to, or if they want to, and just go ahead and take her to the lane. But they're saying, no, not for that right now. Let's see what they want to first pick. Okay, still the Varus and Callista duo of Marksman banned out as well. See if they yeah. uh, continue on with some uh, some early picks along that line. Ezreal and Ash both available still. Trundle pick, Felios I kind of like it well. with the... Uh, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I just think the failure is there as well. Yeah, true, true. Um, and again, a lot of people have uh started to walk away from the champion or at least put a little bit of distance so i like cloud nine uh, going the ezreal route here especially for sven has been super strong with it yeah i, I do want to point out Aphelios, of course was nerfed in 10.13 mm -hmm. looking at all leagues globally including uh regional leagues like eu masters Aphelios is still the second or third most picked in band champion in pro play he's still above 80 percent presence you know, this may still fall away over time as teams realize, yeah, there are better substitutes, but even in the early days of the patch, people are still very keen on playing this one. Lee Sin again here for Blabber. It's going to tie Olaf as most games played this split. Says, yeah, you can make a lot of different plays as champion. 
obviously not always a hard farmer, but he is very efficient in getting his gold. And there's the Aphelos we expected to see. So it's like the patch never happened. We've got <laughs> very, very standard AD carries and junglers for both these teams. Oh, woo, Aphelios is real again. Uh, honestly, woo! for the lane, uh, a lot of marksmen have been talking about how they do like the extra range, obviously, with Ezreal, uh, and that's one of the big things you can use against the Felios, but I just like the Lee Sins into Trundle. Uh, I know there's a lot of people critiquing, uh, you know, some of the junglers that don't scale as well, but Lee Sin, especially for Cloud9, can create so much action for them, and we've seen Blabber in the last two games, this is his third Lee Sin in a row, uh, you know, diving turrets super early on, uh, trying to force a lot of plays for the team, and if they lock in Rakan on top of it, that okay. is a huge playmaking once again for Cloud9. So Rakan locked in support, did also receive buffs in 10.13. Interestingly, Rakan does not always pick the same skill order. Sometimes they max W first, sometimes they max it last, both in solo queue and pro play. It's kind of seemingly based on player taste. But if you max W first, it's going to do 20 more damage at max rank. And if Vulcan wants to go super hard and go and aggro on people, he's going to have a bit more damage on those engages. And that seems, based on the copper seeing so far, like the more likely setup here. The Ezreal in the back line. Um, I actually like him a lot in dive teams because the ulti can always reach, but also you can self-peel when you're left alone. So I think he works really well in aggressive team compositions. Uh, even though Ezreal is not usually considered such an aggressive champion, he still benefits off those comps pretty well. Yeah, I definitely agree. The, the extra mo mobility goes a very long way. Um, especially because, honestly, almost all Cloud9 comps are some form of dive comp. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> They definitely focus early on these skirmishes and on trying to dive and push that ahead. Galio is going to be banned out, as that would be a really good piece that synergizes with Rakan, especially uh, being a super good delivery for that and being able to layer those two CC. So I like that ban from CLG. Meanwhile, Cloud9 taking out a couple of those solo laners uh, that they don't want uh, CLG to be blinding. All right, the last few seconds tick down to CLG ban. Another mid laner away from Niski here, who has been Playing a fair bit of Galio. There's the Jace gone there as well. So the most picked champions for both the solo laners have been banned out there with two picks apiece. They're gone this time. And now C9 needs to blind pick one of their solos. They could go for a flex when they could go into both lanes. Wukong, though, is just a top laner realistically and would be a very strong one at that. Okay, Cloud9 did play it with Licorice before. That was with, you know, Twisted Fate plus a lot of jungle attention, all camping for Licorice. And uh, completely blasting the top side. It's, it looks like it's going to get locked in again here. So let's see. There's no Twisted Fate this time around. Maybe still Blabber does you know, throw some attention up there, but uh, blinding Wukong is is definitely punishable. You can, you can have some strong um, melee matchups into it. Uh, I know a lot of people that like Jason sets as far as melee ones. You can also go the AP route if you want since yeah, magic resist stuff is uh, yeah. passive, but uh, I like a lot of the bruiser options. Yeah, might see some magic damage out there. Of course, we have physical damage in the jungle, physical damage in the bot lane there as well. We'll see what that ends up being there as the Syndra comes through, and Malphite is magic damage. Likes to build a lot of armor so we can withstand the Wukong pressure, and I mean, he'll be armor typed pretty well. The problem is there aren't a lot of good Malphite ult targets. Ezreal on land, or at least on very, very low ping, which is the case here, since the LCS is online after all. The server's in LA, and so you've got like six ping on these servers, and Zven should have no problem market shifting away. But now it means what are you going to play alongside this? Syndra has good single target deletion. Malphite has good target access. So Rumble, Ooh. a bit tankier of a mid lane mage. They need magic damage to the composition. They say, yeah, Rumble can easily go forward with the engage tools, and I can withstand a lot of this pressure as well. Yeah, and Niski's been flying the Phoenix One flag, throwing up that emote over and over every chance he gets in the game. So makes sense that he's going to use one of Doombee's best champions that he has been using very frequently in the LPL, in the Rumble. And he plays that style as well. We talked about it so much with uh, the roaming support that Niski lends to uh, both of the side lanes, roaming with Blabber, trying to create a lot of those kills and really push the Lee Sin aggression up to another level. Biggest thing about Rumble is, of course, on your level six, you have so much more uh, team fighting power, but also being able to chase people down with those slows and the long range cast of your equalizer. Um, you can you can join from a much further distance than most of the uh, other mid laners, even if he's not Twisted Fate and he's going to get there with yep. a gold card, it's still a lot of damage. 
Yeah, a lot of range, and I, I'm actually glad you mentioned early game pressure here as well and mentioning the junglers because 10.13 nerf Syndra as well. The first eight levels of the game, her Q costs more mana, so her, her wave clear, her early lane management is not quite as good either. So in the first you know nine minutes of the game, we may see Niski get the jump a little bit more often uh, unless Pobelter can can get the you know the first blue handed off at 7.30 or so and, and kind of weather that storm. It, it still will mean less pressure in the early game, and that's something to watch out for. How, how, you know, how much can the mid laners move around? around because yes Niski is all about getting to the side lanes all about setting his teammates up I'm not sure how much you can dive a Malphite I'm not sure how much you can dive for an Ezreal but uh, <laughs> we still expect there to be pressure on those sides we definitely expect there to be pressure in a cloud nine game let's see if CLG have what it takes to be the first to take them down in summer everybody's trying to be the first see if they can get that one game off of cloud nine but Cloud9 look like they've got that 18-0 in their sights and have been sticking to it. All righty, Super Galaxy Comeback Breaker. Niski is going to hope that he can make sure CLG don't get a comeback into this game. I want to point something out that's kind of interesting because uh, Cloud9 people say they have a very good early game overall, but it really depends on when you measure the stat. If you're measuring it at 15, yeah, they are clapping everyone. They're up two and a half drakes every single time they're they're up in a bunch of gold if you measure it at 10 only two of their players have a gold lead at 10 minutes jungle mm -hmm. and mid uh, everyone else tends to be a little bit behind the other teams are good at laning against them it's when you get into any mid game skirmish at all that's when cloud nine turns it on um and so the first 10 i think are where clg can strike their early game not particularly good either. None of their players have gold leads at 10 minutes, despite their four and two record. They win the games; they're just not ahead early on. Cloud Nine spike a little bit earlier and are an overall stronger team. And I'm just kind of curious what this early game ends up looking like as a result here. I've got some more stats for you as well yeah. that really define the the Cloud Nine uniqueness in their play style. So Blabber has the most kills in the LCS coming into this week. Um, of any player, not just any jungler. And by the way, there's not even another jungler in the top 12 of kills in the LCS. It's just Blabber at the top. Now, Niski is number four in assists for all LCS players. And there's not another mid laner in the top 12 for assists. Let's put that on hold as we have Blabber going for a red buff level two game bottom. Double knockup, ignite onto Stixay. Here's a Lee Sin, ward hop in, can't land the Q. Stixay flashed up and not down, and Blabber had to guess. Nice of him to flash behind Smoothie, but look at that, already two summoners gone off the very first gank of the game. Yeah, he made a beeline straight from red buff all the way down to the bottom side. Uh, combining with Vulcan with the Ignite, they get double summoners off of Sticks. They force the bad back for him as well. Be able to purchase much there, and Blabber gets right back into blue side clear. Like we say, free, creating that early action. Poor Lee Sin doesn't waste any time at it. Decent damage out of Ruin, though. Able to land quite a few spells down there. Is going for the standard sort of mana sustain, right? He's got Scorch. He's got. Uh... Uh, Comet and all that stuff, but he's getting a lot of damage down here on the Licorice to the half HP. There's gonna be a Brawl! One more auto! The Flash follow! Ruin has a Q soon. He might- No! He walked into Vision! Licorice just bopped him with a staff and gets the solo kill top lane! <laughs> just bopped him on the head. There you go. Oh my oh. goodness. The Flash follow right there. Ruin uh, fought him with the minions and the clone right next to him as well. Both of them were uh, channeling their potions and... Uh, Licorice is going to be able to take this one home. Let's see here. Let's see exactly how many minions are helping out with the fight as well. He chases him into the triple range plus the cannon. The clone got one auto off. Uh, and then with the extra auto there, yeah. Licorice was one auto ahead on this trade. And as you mentioned, he yeah. goes into vision first, so it's an easy key out of the brush. He's going to land. Flash to pull him into the turret. He says, okay, no gank to be had. But now Wiggly's here walking through the lane. That's going to be a lot of damage there. A nice scatter. Pobalter buys his teammate the time, but that is flashed down on four members within four minutes on the CLG side. It's very fun to watch C9 work here. Uh, top lane earned the flash diffs uh, themselves uh, with Licorice there, but Blabber making some quick work of both of the other lanes. In that scenario, when they're all down like this, uh, all of the lanes for CLG now have to be second-guessing themselves. You can see they're all at their turrets. Every member of CLG uh, very wary at the moment, and that's when Blabber can return to farm the camps after you know the aggressive work has been done and allowing the links to What I find impressive is Blabber's jungle path was red buff top side, 
into bottom lane, and he is equal in farm to the opposing jungler. That is just absurdly shocking to me that somehow he's farmed equally, despite the fact that he had to run 5,000 units to gank. And now, yes, Ward hops into lane, but Ruin has walked back enough, obviously with the Q, gets the move speed, kites away, no gank for Blabber. Wiggly here for the counter gank, though, and a level lead for Ruin. This fight could go very, very well. He's gonna get hit there, and Blabber, ooh, that pillar was sick by Wiggly. It's not gonna turn into a kill, but that was so nice. It stops the safeguard. And big thing here, there's no teleport on Licorice because he just needs it to go out, out to lane uh, towards that mid lane play that they tried to pull off. So it's a really well-timed move from Wiggly to push them off uh, and create some pressure there. Because of it, Licorice is not backing though and they don't have to pressure to deny the minion wave. So it ends up turning into nothing for CLG as Licorice still is able to get the minions up in the tower. And Licorice gonna knock down the wave pretty well. Very expertly done here on Wukong. Knows the damage output, knows he can get it with one or two autos. The double longsword obviously really helpful in that one. The uh, 300 gold for the kill would not have allowed them that otherwise, but knocks down the wave, is going to feel really comfortable. Tiamat done, that's now a lot of wave control. That's going to feel really comfortable as Ven TP's down to the bottom lane. Tier is stacking up now, gets the coal on that one as well, as there was much else to buy except a longsword if he was going for Trinity Force. So, yeah, I don't want to buy Sapphire Crystal, we'll just get the AD instead. Yeah, exactly. Definitely agree with that one. Checking the potions and keeping the minions uh, right in front of his tower. So he wants to deny as many of these minions as he can. There's no teleport for 6A since he went the heal flash version. So he can deny a decent amount of that wave and increase the CS lead for uh, for the Vulcan Sven, plus allowing Vulcan to go roam around with Flabber. Pretty big power opening here for Cloud9. Look at that. It's under 6 minutes 30 into the game, and Cloud9's jungler is hitting the Drake. I've seen this story before, and it's called every Cloud9 game of the entire split. Ulti burn now on the top side. Liquid getting big damage on a ruin. Second ult comes in, and that is our difference. That is a solo kill times two in the top lane. Level 6 Wukong. You always got to watch out for the all-in freak. Double ultimate activation there for Licorice. He stacked up the Conqueror so easily. He's got his early Tiamat too, so just annihilates the wave. Licorice with the Wukong once again, showing the rest of the North American top laners what they are missing out on. Yeah, I mean, this is this is what top lane looks like when you go for the solo kill and it backfires on you back at level three. This lane looks different without that gold injection, but obviously now it's going to be a real tough one for Ruin and the rest of CLG to navigate. This early game is going to look great for Licorice, going to pad his stats a ton on the season averages, a 800 gold lead individually, which is the vast majority of the gold lead in this game. All right, quick blue hand off to Poe Belter, see if he can get back, uh, doesn't lose out on any of the minions. We haven't even really seen a big influence of the of the mid lane roam that we're kind of hyping up for Niski. There's been a lot of just blabber Lee Sin, uh, you know, creating some opportunities, and then Licorice by himself, <laughs> doing work on Wukong. He earned his own experience advantage with the uh, with the one v one solo kill, by the way, as well. Yeah, uh, and it was, to be fair, just one auto difference as far as uh, you know how close it was and the miscalculation. But that that means a whole lot as Cloud9 can use that to snowball. Rift Herald will be picked up uh, pretty easily for them because you can see Wiggly is on the bottom half of the map for Trundle, and again, both their lanes are under their towers. Syndra trying to clean up the minions. Malphite now finally hitting level 6, but not much they can do there either. That is a nice hook. That's damage on a Rakan, but of course he can easily kite back to his squad and just jumps back and it's not an issue at all. All right. Uh, mid lane or top lane with the Rift Hailed? Looking like they want to do some sort of uh, counter jungling first. Ruin does have ultimate, so with the ult and flash, it's unlikely that he dies in any sort of top lane focus, but they you know, might be able to get some cooldowns out of him. Blast plant popped. Wiggly's going to look for the dive down here. This is a potential 3v2. Ulti up for Smoothie. He can take turret for a bit. Getting some turret damage. They get the plate. Wiggly's going to kill the ward. No other play to be had. TP's not available. Instead, it's a top side play. Blabber wants with Licorice. Kicks him back. Okay. Crowd control. There's the first knockup. There's a whole lot more. Malphite's not going to live through this one. Ruin ulti just does nothing. But Pumalter? Yeah, only finds some poke. Can't even go for the kill on that one either. They dodged the aggro on the turret so very well. Cloud9 now going to summon the Herald and Niski. Niski wants in. Pobelter has to be warned. He's slowed. Here comes the squad. There's Flash suddenly out of nowhere. Vulcan's in there as well, and they find two kills topside. And the big thing here, Cloud9, they completely 
completely give up on their weak side. Vulcan says, I am out of here. This is weak side of the map. He's not going to waste any time. Ven can just stand there very safe with the Ezreal. He kites way back, doesn't give up any kills for Cloud9. It allows them the extra person just completely overloading their strong side of the map, even getting the extra kill onto Pope Belter as Vulcan got back out, goes over the yeah. wall, and they chase down another one, plus the entire turret, including turret plates. Uh, and first turret bonus picked up. At the very least, it is four plates picked up bot side for CLG as well. They really, really pushed Sven's far back. He had to bleed out for this one, but I mean, that's, you take those, right? You're you're down four plates, you're up 20 CS, and your top lane is hard snowballing. Yeah, that's fine. Sven's gonna be completely okay here. He's not gonna get brutalized much more afterwards, and that's gonna feel really comfortable. Mid lane scrap happens again. Niski just keeps throwing out the sad B. Every time he's not able to get the entire wave, but yeah, he's fine. All right, and just like that, remember, their quote-unquote weak side of the map was already so far ahead in CS for Sven and Vulcan that he still has over a 20 CS lead for himself and trying to push back on that tower and get some turret plates for themselves for Cloud9. Again, with uh, with the roam starting now to come through for Niski, we just saw... Uh, top side one, adding the extra damage with the Rumble Ultimate. Now, he just hovered halfway down through the red buff uh, side of the jungle to threaten uh, with, this bottom, with this bottom side push in tandem. And it's just, it's just at this point, it's too difficult to deal with the power swings from Cloud9. Um, already setting up for, uh, for another Dragon 35 seconds ahead. Nicole is stacking, the farm is being gained, and are you ready to defend bot lane here? Control Ward in the brush, that's gonna get spotted out by Vulcan. Says, okay, yep, we know what's going on down here. Let's just give Sven some alone time. Let's just have Stick Say and Smoothie fail to get any farmer experience. They finally walk in with the last two caster minions. Turret plate's already almost gone, so Sven's farming that one back without much issue. There only is a two plate difference down there. The farm difference, still 30 between these two. That's gonna make up for that one no problem at all. Obviously the Vulcan roams are nice, and CLG, Look at a bit like game one of the season where they're not getting anything on the board. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's really hard to critique the teams playing against Cloud9 as yes. most of them have looked very similar, but definitely agree. They're uh, super struggling, especially, of course, with, uh, you know, all the stuff that went on top side uh, and the Malphite picked into it. It's just, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not much going to get much out of this. So Cloud9, just stack it right up. Dragon number yep. two, right on schedule, Freak. And uh, they they actually have a decent amount of, uh, of mid-game options, too. Let's see how long it takes uh, for them to finish up on the bottom turret. Looking going to be a little help from Pobolton to keep his farm up. This Trundle does have decent gold income, equal level, up about three camps over Blabber. Wiggly can be useful. Obviously, this game is still 3,500 apart, and that is ludicrously different. We're not even 13 minutes in, and the gold lead is... I mean, a big one even for a mid-game goal. This is still pretty early on in the game. Licorice going to be able to grab the Scuttle top side. Two level lead temporarily over Ruin. 10 to 8 up there. That is rough stuff. Obviously, a Malphite can still do his job without gold, but you'd like to have some. Yeah, it's just that Licorice gets to do, like, two people jobs now. <laughs> He's got almost a Trinity Force built up with the Tiamat. He's going full oh, carry man. Wukong. This is gonna be uh, this is gonna be some massive damage to say the least. As soon as they get to these team fights and CLG, like you're saying, they're still gonna stick to the same game plan. You know, they have uh, very straightforward front line to try and set up for stick saves of Felios. Um, you know, Felios definitely needs a couple items before he really brings the, the power behind that setup. But Nautilus ultimate into a Sindra stun and Malphite ultimate should be the tools that they try and use to you know, focus fire someone. Uh, as you mentioned, the champs like those very mobile champions for Cloud9. Yeah, and we saw for a little bit Licorice was trying to freeze up on the top side. Of course, that's difficult with Tiamat. Every last hit just knocks down the mid next to it for, you know, half the attack damage. But he is denying farm. You can see Ruin just not even willing to walk back top side. Instead, he's going to find something else to do around this side of the map. Finally, top has to be pushed down, so he takes the recall there on Licorice's side. And here comes the attempted play, right? We've got four members down here with Syndra missing as well. Sven. Yeah, just gonna throw out cues. He's like, I'm not worried about this one. Yeah, I know you're in fog. Yeah, your team could show up. Yeah, we still don't see Malphite topside. You might be down here. It's been a minute and a half and you're still not up in your lane. We'll wait. No gank? Okay, cool. See ya. Yep, and there's a teleport ready for Licorice. So uh, if they actually get a little bit too far forward here for CLG, you can see Cloud9 are ready to collapse. I was asking, you know, how long left on the bottom lane turret? Doesn't look like very long because they brought 
every single member down here. And it's very straightforward now for, uh, for Cloud9 with this big lead. And with level 11 on Nyx, uh, Nisky now, with level 2 Rumble Ultimate, they can not only take the bottom tower, but they might be looking to collect some kills off of this CO2 bot lane too. And here comes the play. The flash gets away from the anchor kick into the wall. Stick say is low. Blabber needs another auto and he gets it. That's the shield back of the squad as well. A stopwatch buys a few seconds for Smoothie. Knockout's coming around. Rumble over the top. Poe Belter has nowhere to go. He gets a trade kill, so sealed is on the board, but Cloud9 win the fight 2-1. And they want a little bit more. Nisky going to walk into three. He knows he's right in front of him. Maybe more than he wanted. He overheats. His health bar's running low. He looks for the kill. Ruin flashes the wave, but the Q snipe for Vulcan gets one. The flash to safety. C9 gets a third. They get the turret as well. And they're ready to go for turret number two. A steamroller right through the bottom lane. Freak Blabber's flash over the hook of Smoothie 2 was really well done. Right into the face of Stixay. Uh, getting the kick into the wall. Oh my goodness. Like, I, even if you see it coming, uh, it's yeah. still exciting to, to watch the play unfold before you as Cloud9's aggression goes rewarded on the bottom side. They clean up the bottom tower, so uh, easy point for them next. And a rip trail number two is available, and they can use that to crack it. And that's going to be pretty likely here on this one as we watch that fight yet again, and it's just it's so good. It's so good for Blabber here. Let's take a look. Uh, smooth, smooth close. He was in the brush, too. That was coming out of the brush. Uh, Blabber was ready for it. Some of that is he was already probably thinking of, I need to flash on the on belly up to get the kick into the wall. Uh, but the timing of it really works out extremely well there, too, even though he does end up going down. And then you start cheering on Nisky, and you're like, OK, he's got uh, Zonias, and he has flash. So he's playing aggressive, starts out uh, baiting one more member of CO2 for Vulcan to end up killing. Uh, there you go. That's the rip I was yep. talking about. A boom. Mid lane. They want really. ruin. They want ruin. Oh, charm. Knock up. A lot of damage there. Wukong falling through as well. Ruin still. Ophelis does not have the escapes. Licorice on a rampage. Trinity Force is done. He is snowballing, but watch out for Sven. Just arcane shifts as the stun lands. Still able to walk away. Now, let's see. Do they use the rift trailed first charge on the outer turret right there, or are they just trying to knock it over by hand? Um, going looks mid. like they do activate it a little bit further back. So either way, it is going to go down. Um, if you can knock it over by hand first, then Shelly obviously doesn't take a uh, big chunk for health and damage. Yeah. You can do a big chunk on the next one, but boom, it's gone. And there you go. Big chunk yet again. That turret's very, very low. Maybe an auto for Sven. Doesn't want to risk it. Smoothie lands the anchor. Or you're probably going down everything else. Would have loved to get a little bit of burst, but it's fine. No big problems here. The gold difference, oh man, it's 7,000, 17 minutes into the game. This is every single Cloud9 game. You pass 15 minute mark and the gold draft just goes up and to the right rapidly. And it's, it's a steep slope up there. Break number three, gonna drop in a second as well. Yeah, I, and a lot of it, um, yes, we've been focusing on Blabber. He creates so much action for the team. He has insane stats. This time around though, um, I think Licorice should be getting a lot of the accolades because People have meme him on him. He's been memeing himself about a lot of the games, you know, dying uh, first or or even getting first blooded. But this time around, with the extra auto on that 1v1 early, he has yeah. just completely ran his early lead ahead and steamrolled this game. So it just feels like there are no options for CLG. You saw that last kill uh, yep. in the jungle. It was just it was just unbelievable. There's there's no fighting back in that point. It's a full Trinity Force. Um, looking probably for a Death Dance uh, after this as well to go full 1v9 mode carry. Yeah. Uh, very, the, ma the main standard build for Wakong. And nothing for him to uh, be deterred by. Vulcan tries to bring the reinforcement. Licorice plays like he's afraid of them. Smoothie gonna walk around. He's got Pumulta nearby as well. So here's the charm. Here's the knockout. They find backline. Big damage though. This could be the kill right away. And Blabber can't get through it. Bit of MR, but not enough. Good defense by CLG. Get the second kill of the game. Defending their blue buff. Yeah, huge. You need to you need to take every blessing that you can get. Nice lockdown there on the Blabber. Cutting off the Lee Sin. Also, they do secure the blue buff, uh, as you say, for Poe Belter for the Syndra. It's gonna be. Pretty big for him and trying to keep up with this farm. As I say that though, I see another wave that was pushed into the bottom turret by Misty uh, that starts dying, as well as this mid tower being so incredibly low already. Let's see what they go for next. Blabber is back on the map now, ready to run back down. You're seeing he's got the individual 12 on a gold lead. Mid is close in farm. That's the only lane that's really that way. Everyone else is at least a thousand over their opponent, or at least close to it in the case of support. 
Who's gonna go for this one? Licorice is around. The smite <laughs> was early, Wiglio. I'm so sorry for you. That's a heartbreak. That is 100 gold going the other way. Uh, we gotta start playing uh, some more little house games here. Like, okay. <laughs> he starts messing around, but who's gonna get the, the grop? Uh, does get in, you know, try and steal those types of things, or even. What are we thinking about, uh, you know, the Cloud9, the Cloud9 interview after this? Because they've become all the same. Where all the members are just like, yeah, we're we're waiting for a team in North America to to challenge us. Yeah, I know the closest they said someone got was Team Liquid. They obviously beat them handily, but they said, look, mm -hmm. of the scrim records, Team Liquid's is the closest. Not that they're winning in scrims that often, but <laughs> they're at least winning sometimes. You know, they, they're mortal. They can bleed at least in practice. I mean, this is a squad that lost two games across, I don't know, a good 35 last split. And, uh, you know, they're they're about seven games in now and not showing any signs of slowing down. This is the best team in North America. They are absurdly far ahead of everyone. They are aggressive. They are exciting. They are fun. And they're going to keep going. I want to see how long this can run for them. Ruin's going to try, get some nice knockup, get some damage. Pillars there as well. Here comes Licorice's attempt at it as well, but there's just still a flash going over. He's trying to run away. The slows are still in. True Shot Barrage won't quite land. The Anchor's going to hit the turret. And here comes the ulti. They're finally getting the kill. It took three, but they get the kill picked off. There is Licorice going down for his first death of the game. And the rest of Cloud9 pushing on the other side of the map. When they're so far ahead like this, and SOG can get this many members, you need to be able to get stuff with the rest of your team as four members of COG pretty much commit to the tower dive. It's going to cost them a tower of their own, but you have to make those plays for COG. That's that's the first step, definitely a, a big one for them, cutting down the Grish. That was a, a gold bounty off of the Wukong, and they yeah. did get their first outer tower killed. Well done there for COG, trying to climb and claw their way back into this one. The only downside of that shutdown was kill credit went to Smoothie's Nautilus. Uh, you would have liked that. I mean, it's not like any of them are that big of gold scalers. It was Malphite, Trundle, Nautilus going together for it, but still kind of sucks to go to support. You don't gain that much more power with items here in the support rule. You get tankier, but that doesn't really mean that much in most cases. Regardless, CLG feeling a bit more comfortable. Gold lead staying at 7,000. Very large one, but at least it's not growing just yet as they take bottom scuttle. They know Mountain Soul comes in in a minute, and with Mountain Soul, this game is basically unlosable as CLG's sort of persistent damage is not that high right now. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to look at burst damage then. Well, Belter's got a Spellbinder for Syndra. You've got to try and find one of these squishier carries. That's one of the things with the Cloud9 roster. They play a lot of these aggressive compositions uh, with a lot of playmaking and, and not a lot of tanking. So you have to watch out for Niski Zonias. Uh, don't Syndra ult that one because he's in the unit. But try and pick off one of those carries, use the Spellbinder, get some big uh, damage, and, and try and do a an attack and retreat. You, you get your kill, uh, you back off to recuperate before uh, you know C9 can take advantage of your cooldowns being used. Blabber able to sweep the wards, has the Umbral Glaive first item after the Warrior Pobelter. Trying to get vision, but he could be jumped on from Fog. They don't know he's there for sure, but... It could be in that brush, but they're going to walk in. Reveals one. Licorice is there. Not going to burn the ulti just yet. Pillar's going to be nice, though. It's a re-engage. It's Blabber uh -huh. going for the kick. And they found Stixay. There is no team fight left. Smoothie not going to walk away too easily. Pops stone plate. Q's not going to land. Rumble through the top. He's burning down. He goes back through it. Why did you Q to the right? Trade kill on the Vulcan? Not just yet. Here comes the re-engage. Vulcan back to safety. Oh. Mount Light lands on nobody. They all juke away from it, and Cloud9 are just more skilled than the other teams here. CLG's on the run. Ruin's going to try. Zven flashes the wall. One last Q to get the ace. And it's oh. time for Mountain Soul plus the base to go down. Cloud9 running over this game. That is the best team in North America, Freak. That is Cloud9 just styling in CLG's jungle. Oh my goodness. Oh, Vulcan goes to go check to make sure that the kill is going to come through on the burn down from Niski's ultimate. And they think they could try and get something on the backside again. A stopwatch usage. He's able to just slide right out. Guys in the Malphite ultimate to whiff. Oh my goodness. Can't. What, what, this feels like such an unassailable task for the team to take down Cloud9. Blabber is here as well with his Q on Smoothie, be able to use it to go over and kick Sticks A in. Just, ah, oh my goodness. Walk, walking right into that one as uh, they look like they were escaping, walking away. 
absolutely baiting it in there. And then here's again, uh, Orphan's slick escape. Stopwatch buys just enough time, and the double dash plus the heal. No escape for MCS yeah. members either. Predictive too, it was, it was Vulcan. First of all, shot out a spell button going into barrier, so he's like unkillable. That was really nice. Mm -hmm. And then he, it, as soon as he eats backwards, he W's off to the side, as does Ven, RK Shipping off to the side to dodge Malphite. So they're like, yeah, we're all grouped up here. This is a Malphite ult. Let's just preempt the cast of the spell. He's going to go for it. And they were right. Really beautiful stuff right there. Cloud9, absurdly ahead. Mountain Soul is on. Gold lead 10,000. Baron's on the table at 25 minutes. And not going to stop them anytime soon. Yeah. All right, with the Baron, that's going to be Cloud9 marching towards CLG base, looking to end it with this one. It has not really taken Cloud9 more than a Baron in the game thus far. Don't expect it to this time either, but 10,000 gold behind, facing a Magic Soul, facing the Baron, and CLG will have to defend their face against all odds. What did they come up with, Freak? Uh, they're going to come up with turtling in the base and hoping a team fight materializes in front of them. I'm not expecting big plays to come through. They're going to sit behind this wall. They're going to look for maybe an engage, but Syndra's not anywhere nearby. Ulti just zones off smooth. He doesn't do a whole lot. Not the best equalizer, to be fair. Not the cleanest. Stick say hasn't burned the ulti just yet, but I mean, they're so tanky. Like, they did all that damage and it just popped the Mountain Soul shield off, and now it's back. I, I think that's, you know, just the fact that the level ultimate is down. Uh, CLG might be hoping for some some extra miracle here. With, uh, Cloud9, though, they're just sending uh, Licorice over towards mid to get the double push with their Baron buff. And as you can see, that cannon minion threatening to finish off the top tower by itself. Now, these waves are not synced up. Um, so CLG can ping pong. You ping pong towards mid, deal with that one. Then you get back towards the bottom one, try and deal with that one. Um, and uh, the split push doesn't have as big of an effect, but you really have to jump on the opportunity. Okay, Anchor goes in again. Sven reflexes solid, gets away from that one. This one cooling for a few seconds. Then there's Malphite into the back line. They find some CC. Hold these straight back forward, and here comes the kick. It's not going to get too much, but they will catch Pole Belters. Wukong gets the back line, and Rumble helps out as well. Ruin's gone now on top of that one. Wiggly can't find the kills, and it's Dixay basically in his support. And there's Equalizer number two. Can't get away, and Ace again without any depth. Cloud9 walking over CLG, 27 minutes in, the second ace with the wave, ready to knock down the Nexus turrets. Cloud9 will not be stopped, there will be 7 and 0. They will drop CLG to their third loss, only three kills in this game. Cloud9 have no equals, they show it again today. No miracle at the end of that game, Freak. Uh, Cloud9. Honestly, they're better. <laughs> like, how else do you sum this up? They are so much better than everyone else. That is just the unassailable truth of Cloud9 and the LCS. On their worst day against someone else's best day, they might lose. But until you show me a pattern of being a substantially better team, no one even comes up to their shoulders here. You've got waste at most. They're, like, not even in the camera shot when you're taking these selfies, right? Cloud9 are way up here, and, and one day we might see someone catch up. But for now, every other team is battling for second. And what I've liked in, in some of the teams that have given them a bit of a run, uh, they focus yeah. super heavily on the early game. Uh, I think any, any of the teams that kind of seed any sort of ground, just even in champ select towards the early game, or towards any sort of matchup that Cloud9 can pry open, are, are doomed. Um, and we've seen a couple of times uh, uh, of these teams drafting for some super strong matchups and you know trying to keep it interesting, getting some early kills there. So, I mean, that's where you've got to start, is what I feel like. Yeah, early games have been winnable. Again, as you mentioned, three of these players have a negative gold difference at 10. These lanes can be won. The individual skill in, in the 1v1s and 2v2s is there in the league. We've seen it from the teams, but when the minutes, you know, past 10, that's when it starts getting incredible. That's when the C9 synergy really shows up. Yes, we might see some early game pressure. It's if that next 5 to 10 can be shored up for the team, maybe they can start measuring up. They haven't been able to do it yet. We'll see, though. Of course, more games to play. Now we're stepping away, but after that break, Vulcan will be joining Pacey Time for the Verizon post-game interview. So don't miss it. Verizon knows how to build unlimited right. You start with America's most awarded network, the one with unbeatable reliability 13 times in a row. This network is one less thing I have to worry about. Then you give people more plans to mix and match, so you only pay for what you need. Verizon unlimited plan is so reasonable, they can stay on for the rest of their lives. You include the best in entertainment, 
and you offer it all starting at $35. Because everyone deserves the best. This is Unlimited Built Right, only on Verizon. Your Honda MVP. Dreams aren't achieved overnight. They take passion. It's Mr. World right? Dedication. And even then, there are no guarantees. But for the LCS, that's the power of dreams. Too bad. It means you never give up. It means you always play again. Honda, proud automotive partner of the LCS. Hello and welcome to the Verizon Post Game Interview. I'm joined by Vulcan from the once again victorious Cloud9. Starting to feel like uh, I don't even need to, you know, predict the game because you guys are just winning everything. Yeah, uh, I'm getting pretty used to winning too. I think. Um, I mean, last year I used to be like winning a game felt amazing, and now winning a game is just the expected. It's getting a bit boring, you know. Maybe I should lose some to get back to winning, feeling better, I guess. Maybe. I mean, I know you also said that uh, right now it does feel like while the metagame is pretty exciting for a lot of the roles, uh, support has been a little bit stale. Do you, do you like having to play kind of similar champions? Do you wish you could mix it up a little bit more? Um, well, honestly, compared to last week, I'm playing more champs than I was at, that, at like at this point. You know, I, I think it took like four weeks for me to not play either Tom Kench or Nautilus. So <laughs> I, I'm playing more different champions this time around, so that feels good. Also, Recon is one of the most uh, fun support champs, so it felt good to, you know, pull it out today. Um, but yeah, I think uh, having to play Nautilus, because it, it feels like most in most cases, Nautilus is my best pick, and it's a very boring champ, so the meta is kind of boring, yep. yeah. Uh, 
do you feel like you're getting to play different champions because you've been with the team a bit longer, you have a little bit more agency? Do you feel like the team is willing to be a bit more experimental or it's just a little bit wider as far as what choices you can you can pick in the current meta? I think it's just kind of my personal opinion about how much I can impact the game. I feel like most games I'm playing Nautilus, even though maybe my lane is stronger or I'm more reliable in team fights, I feel like I can do more with a champion like Rakan or maybe Thresh. I can afford offer more to my team, more like Rakan is more defensive than Nautilus is, or Thresh with the Lantern, you can both engage and disengage. So um, I feel like Nautilus is a bit useless compared to the other champs that offer much more and and the team value, in my opinion, is a lot. So it's pretty much it. It's working out. I mean, the sheer amount of playmaking you have produced this split is already pretty incredible. Uh, but the wildest thing to me with all that is that somehow you've barely died. <laughs> How is that possible for you to play aggressive champions to make all these plays, but have only three deaths so far this split? Um, I think it's pretty easy for my position to not die much because a lot of my teammates are going in. Um, Nisi played Rumble today, goes in, he plays Galio, goes in as well. Blabber is a known inter, so we'll go in, soak the pressure, <laughs> thanks kill shots, you know, so... Um, and Eric, you know, he's a weak side uh, inter sometimes, Specialist. so it'll take... Specialist, yes, that's what I meant. Um, weak side specialist, so he, he thanks uh, the pressure well, and so I don't have to die a lot. All right, well, so all that leads to uh, my final question here, which is uh, you are second currently on the global KDA leaderboard. Not not, not domestic, global KDA leaderboard. Uh, Zite Note is currently ahead of you by a lot, but if he dies once, his KDA gets halved because he only has one death currently, and you would overtake him based on the current numbers. So are you clamoring for that rank one KDA spot? Uh, every night before I go to sleep, I just dream of being rank one global KDA, you know, and that's why I'm not dying a lot. I'm playing for my KDA. I'm playing really insecure. Um, yeah, I just hope I can be rank one. Well, it's certainly working out so well. Volkan, thank you so much for chatting to me. Thank you. All right, well, for more on that game, Volkan's KDA, and to break down the day, let's hand it back over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you, Pastry Time. It takes a 24-7 commitment through your dreams to be the championship caliber that Vulcan has brought to the table, alongside the rest of C9, who, what a surprise, have shown us once again that they continue to lead the league in wins and innovation. Yeah, I mean, another Wukong game is really easy. You know, it was just a clean, clean execution. They counterpicked it. Doesn't matter. It's Wukong. They play it all the time. You heard Licorice say it last week in his interview. You can play at weak side, you can play at strong side, you can get counterpicked. You know, it really doesn't matter. You just have to keep picking this champion. Yeah, this, I mean, was a, this was a nice blind pick. <laughs> this is a blind pick from Licorice, so he's taking the counter. And yeah, like Mark said, he says in an interview, this champion is too OP, it doesn't matter. You should just pick it anyways. And to have no one else pick it, but Licorice is pretty crazy. Well, Mark, I guess, is picking it by eating a banana on camera. So that's his version of picking Wukong. Yeah, yeah. Mark, can you do me a favor and um, say I slit the sheet, the sheet I slit, and on the slitted sheet I sit? Uh, no, I can't. And I don't have a banana in my mouth anymore. Aww, but I just, I just couldn't say that normally. Uh, but yeah, Wukong's really strong. Standard. I mean, a lot of people talk about Wukong being like this weak side champ, but this is the second game in a row where a lot of the plays actually end up going to the top side. And it's where they blew a lot of the game open, you know. There was an early gank to the bot lane for Blabber to blow some sums and stuff. Uh, but Licorice, after getting two solo kills, and they, he you know, was like, oh, we can start pushing in top and I win this matchup now. They did a good job actually playing around the Wukong because he has such good tools. He has high damage, high setup, uh, you know, two, two mobility spells. So you can do a great job executing around him. And people just need to get on that Wukong train. Yeah. Speaking of the things that Cloud9 brings to the table, and obviously Vulcan had some fun poking at the jungler there, but Wild Turtle, when we look at Cloud9, we talk about the strength that they've brought throughout game to game, but do you see any changes that they are making in striving for that consistent success? Uh, I think they're just constantly getting better as well as the split's going on. Uh, nothing much to say, you know, just C9 doing C9 things. Once D9 is doing C9 things, though, and you're on the opposite side, you got a hefty task on your table. And CLG, we've got to evaluate it. We keep talking about whether they are a pretender or a contender in the second place bubble that we have currently within these standings. So, Prali, how did you perceive their performance here against Cloud9? Uh, not good. Uh, I do think the early game C9 is like the most exploitable. That's where I think like you can actually go up to them. I still think they have probably the three strongest laners in the game, 
but the first 10 minutes is where you can grab your gold lead that we've seen this split and that's the only way really to come back if you can see like as soon as they hit the 10 minute mark with a gold lead it's just constantly getting better for them i mean there's not really <laughs> i don't see them slowing down in this in any of these gold graphs yeah, I mean, we, we gave out that metric that we were going to say, this is the C9 measuring stick. Uh, you know, try to have a gold lead by 10, try to have a gold lead by 20. It was a straight, you know, straight line down to the right. Nosedive. That's it. <laughs> nosedive. <laughs> we want a straight line, flat line. No nosedives, please. But aside nope, from they, the... the nosedive right down. Yeah. Uh, aside from the nosedive and the general overall gold aspect that we've been using as that kind of stick tracker, do you feel that there are other things that Cloud9 could have done at certain points in the game to try and not allow that to get so out of control? Yeah, I think CLG had a really good opportunity, and I'm going to pull up a little image for you guys to use your eyes on. Let's just look look at that nice little mini-map we got there. Mm. So. What we're seeing is, or what we know right now is, Lee Sin just level two ganked bot. And so we know his whole top side is up, but right now we have Wiggly making the choice to go into the bot side jungle. Now, this is bizarre to me. Not only because the top side is completely open for him to take control of, but if you see this top lane matchup, you see that little Wukong in the top, the little Marky Mark up there? He's playing such a volatile matchup. He's using his entire body to shove the wave in. So if you see Trundle at race right now, he could be at the enemy race right now. And imagine how terrifying this would be for the top lane uh, Licorice to actually play this matchup out. This was a counter matchup they had, and they had a chance to actually give it pressure because of Blabber's choice to level 2 gank bot. But he goes bot here, he takes his wraiths, and now he's not in time to take any pressure off of the top laner. So this is the kind of stuff I think you can't make a mistake on. If Blabber level 2 ganks, you need to be able to punish that pretty quickly, or else you're probably not going to get anything. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't get anything off of the early game. And yes, there is the pathing that comes into that, the jungle matchup that we're talking about. But Cloud9 has obviously, or not Cloud9, CLG has rather put a lot forward in trying to improve their synergy and unity as a team. Mark, do you feel that some of these mistakes were made on individuals or was it just maybe some communication issues or overweighting or overstaying in certain points of the map? It's hard to know uh, without being inside there. You know, we were all speculating what could possibly be Wiggly's intention. You know, we were saying, oh, maybe it's about getting down bot side to cover a potential gank we were throwing out there. Maybe it's a predetermined route about wanting to clear down there and not playing to the Malphite Wukong side. Um, maybe the bot lane didn't say, well, what happened? And then like, oh yeah, Blabber's down here. You know, you never really know on the outside, but either way, there is still this area of improvement that they could be making um, in terms of, of executing better in the early game. And that's where a lot of their problems stem and where they need to clean up the most. And I'm sure they'll be looking back at this in an attempt to do so going into the matches they have ahead. Because as per usual, these were just the first two matches that we have. And they started to shake up the standings. That clump of five that I talked about before that are currently tied in the second place spot. CLG has now officially fallen out of leaving Evil Geniuses, FlyQuest, Team Liquid, and TSM continuing to fight in that spot and gap that distance between themselves and Cloud9. While Golden Guardians, after their match today, have climbed and sit at three and four there in the seventh place of the standings. As far as kind of Golden Guardians and where they are standing within this, we've had some questions on their strength as a team. Probably, do you have any more confidence in them now with some of the tweaks that they've made towards the late game and the mid game to follow off on these early game leaps that they've created? That's a hard question. I don't know. Yes, I, I believe so. I'm more conf I'm more. I'm more optimistic on them. I bought their stock. I better be. Uh, you know, they they lost a lot of games. I think from a misread on the meta, or maybe being bad at Nidalee. You know, whatever you want to call it, because teams are still winning with Nidalee elsewhere. Um, I think regardless of that, they they have a clear style that they want to execute on. They're trying to play it, and it looks okay. They need to start picking these wins up against better teams, though. That's totally fair. I mean, we've talked about strength of schedule so much going into this. And some of the other teams at the bottom, we know Dignitas are still vying to make their way up towards the top. But for those that are still currently within the second place standings, Wild Turtle, I know that FlyQuest, for instance, are in that clump. How do you feel about the way that we have been approaching when trying to talk about who the pretenders and contenders are, specifically speaking to FlyQuest and EG from coming over from Spring Split? Well, I definitely think we're still contenders, you know? Like, we have a... Uh really good team and i don't know what else to say about that you know like <laughs> um 
I, I think FlyQuest is definitely a contender. I mean, we, we finished second place last split, and I think we have Power of Evil and Centaurin, who's a really good mid, mid jungle duo. Like, definitely when PoE is on the control mages, and when we get the you know the super trundle pick, we're doing pretty solid. But yeah, I... definitely, definitely looking forward to the rest of the split. And we will get to see a lot of this in action for the rest of the weekends because, as usual, LCS will be returning tomorrow on Saturday as well as Sunday with Golden Guardians looking to close out the weekend 2-0 versus TSM to kick off tomorrow's broadcast. And then we do have Evil Geniuses and FlyQuest in game number three before Team Liquid face off against Immortals. A lot of important matchups here with so many currently tied within the standings. I know, Wild Turtle, you just had your remarks on how you feel FlyQuest and EG have been matched going into this so excited to see all of that come on through now as we go into the rest of the weekend and what we have to come on sunday this does include a classic matchup between clg and tsm for me the clg tsm rivalry died a long time ago from many new fans to the LCS, they won't even remember a time when the CLG versus TSM rivalry was relevant and going strong. It looks like CLG is on the back foot. Oh, uh, well, they're just 3 SM, you know? The rivalry was insane. Probably like 80% of the fans of all LCS were just super invested in CLG or TSM. The rivalry as it stands now, both teams are like shells of their former selves, but deep down, I still have like a fire to beat TSM more than like any other team. I think I can come back because we're both competing for top team spots again. This is probably the match that has mattered the most between TSM and Silji in a long time. It'll just be interesting. I think TSM isn't doing that great right now. And CLG, this split is really rebounding. They're looking strong for sure. For me, I can't say that we are a top team unless we can beat CLG. Let's go! The Kuka Baron does great! Let's go! We about to get it done, let's go! I feel like I could respect them if they showed up and played well against us, but... They just have to do it. We usually cross CLG. I feel like this time, it's gonna be the same. Right now, TSM isn't really a step. They're more of like a pebble in the road to reclaiming our legacy. Tale as old as time, song as old as love. Tale as old as time, indeed. But I mean, according to the beginning of the video, Double F seems to think that this rivalry is dead. Wild Turtle, with your tenure, what is your take on it? Uh, yeah, it definitely feels like um, pretty old, you know? Like, the rivalry was definitely more apparent back then. I think nowadays, C9 is also a pretty strong team, pretty hard to contest against. So, yeah, there's that. Yeah, well, I like the this FlyQuest EG budding rivalry even more. You have the nice guys, FlyQuest, the jerks, EG, battling yeah, last split to try and get in final. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that new rivalry a lot more. Yeah, old the, rivalries, the new <laughs> rivalries. We've got plenty of rivalries in the LCS. Hashtag live evil. But that's going to do it for us here on the Analyst Desk for Friday Night League. Of course, thank you, Wild Turtle, for joining us for our evenings of festivities. And if you're looking to keep the party rocking on, don't forget that the Sushi Dragon is covering your post FNL shenanigans over on his own Twitch channel. So be sure to check that out to set your weekend off right. But... Now, on behalf of myself, the casters, and the entire remote broadcast crew, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for more LCS. And until then, good morning, afternoon, evening, and good night.